Hello, it's Philip Taylor speaking from Richmond Green Chambers in London. This afternoon I'm looking at a book which has come to us from Routledge and is written by our friend uh, Ursula Smart who has produced the second edition of a book entitled Media for Journalists, Media Law for Journalists. It's a useful book on media law. Elizabeth was the lead writer for this review and we've given it a title Where Law and Journalism Meet. The ideal text for journalists and even lawyers now in a new second edition for 2020. Um, as you probably know, Routledge produced a lot of educational books and this is it's part of the Taylor and Francis group. Uh, we reviewed a lot of books over the years from Routledge. This one's a particularly important one, I, I think, because although I'm a practicing barrister, I'm also a teacher. And this is the sort of aid I would find very helpful. That's the front of the book. It's a picture of Sir Cliff Richard. And he's, of course, very well known to many people for his litigation with the BBC. There is the spine. And then there is the back of the book. You probably can't make out much of what's on the spine because of the inverted colour. Um, the back of the book has some very interesting and very useful uh, points on index. It's by page numbering. And you should be able to find things pretty quickly. The book runs to under 300 pages. The front of the book has uh, some blurb about uh, the book itself. Then it has some information about Ursula, whom I will mention in a few minutes. Then we've got Media Law for Journalists, second edition, the uh, main title in colour. There's a nice picture of Ursula. There we go. Give, give Ursula a little bit of a plug there. And you've got some bl uh, blurb there. Then after that you've got the content section and this is very much the way Ursula presents uh, her really fascinating lectures uh, because she's, it's very well structured and there are um, learning outcomes which are of course very useful. Uh, again you've got a large number of chapter headings, I can't go through all of them. The total number of chapters are actually nine and there's a bibliography at the back as I said um, actually it's not a particularly big, big uh, bibliography, there it is there, um, but it's uh, enough to, to help I think. Then there's of course a quite a lot of case law. One of the nice things about this subject is there's, there's a lot of interesting really juicy case law. I mean I can, I can remember the days when we didn't have media law, we actually had the law of defamation as part of the law of tort. And I remember as a student 50 years ago, that was the juicy part of the law because you've got some really interesting cases. I can't see very many of them today, but they they all were about basically people slagging other people off and various other things. But the law has changed quite a bit since then. There are the statutes, so starting off with England and Welsh legislation, Scottish and then statutory instruments, um, and then you've got other, other parts of the world, including the European Union. <laughs> then a very useful glossary. One of the things about the development of media law is that it actually has become very complicated and you do actually need to have a glossary because there's a lot of information here which people may have a difficulty with. What you have got, of course, is the glossary by alphabetic order, which is great fun. You can see a lot of information coming up there. I am flicking through quite quickly so that you could get, you just get a feel for the uh, subject. Going right to the end of it, uh, there's the last main page and then there's a little page after that. Then what Ursula has included is internet sources and other useful websites. Again, very useful. It is media. We're dealing with the media. We're dealing with new technology. We're dealing with a new way of contacting people and expressing opinions and so forth. So it's a different way of doing it. Then there's an important introduction where um, Ursula sets the, sea, um, the, the scene basically for the future. You can see there are blocked out bits to make specific points. Um, there's a point about it, um, exam technique and then the learning outcomes about what you're going to get from the book there. Um, and then you've got a chapter one. You can see you've got a mini index for the chapter, which is, of course, very helpful because that should help you find things quite easily. And, of course, again, you can see the various tables all the way through, which are very helpful indeed. And there's quite a lot of uh, this sort of illustration, which I think does help. Uh, and then, of course, you do have key cases 
highlighted what quite rightly too. Now sometimes you won't quite know the name of the people concerned. So therefore you might see a name and think, well, who is that? And then suddenly you'll realise from probably from reading uh, the various uh, cases in the newspapers, the bits they have published, who, who they're actually talking about. But again, there's, there's another one there. You can see that particular case and so forth. I'm not going to go into a large number of them because again, because it's media, it's about the media people. And media law is a developing area of law in my view. Um, I get a lot of people contacting me about um, concerns they have about what's been on social media and the fact that they've been defamed, they don't like it, they want obviously some sort of remedy and quite often the difficulty is it's about money because it's hurt feelings. The law doesn't see it frankly in the way that many other people see it. The law's mean about damages. It's not particularly helpful when it comes to trying to assert a person's uh, defence of his or her reputation. So therefore you do have uh, really quite difficult problems. Also, it's a very expensive area of litigation and it's a difficult area. And it's an area where it's sometimes quite difficult to, to give an indication to a client as to what will happen. So what do we say about the book? Well, as I say, Elizabeth and I had a long chat about the book again. We'd been to uh, Ursula's previous uh, a presentation of one of her book launches. We haven't been able to do this particular one, uh, but uh, this is what we say. If you're a lawyer, you probably don't need to read this book. It's for journalists, you might think, not lawyers. But wait, do not journalists and lawyers find themselves involved from time to time in the same case as the answer is, particularly those high profile ones that get all that publicity? Uh, the answer is yes, because if you are a media lawyer, then your answer would be, of course, the yes. Or if not, well, maybe. Either way, this new second edition from Routledge um, of Media Law for Journalists uh, by a media specialist and a, a very experienced uh, lawyer, Ursula Smart, can only be to your benefit. Now, she's an academic who lectures at New College of the Humanities at Northeastern University in Boston, Massachusetts, United States of America. And also, Ursula is also a media law researcher at the University of Surrey here in um, England. And she offers a systematic and thorough approach in this book to what is an often complex and wide ranging subject. And it's one that I think is very misunderstood, certainly by clients who assume things which don't really exist. There is some legislation, there's quite a lot of case law, but it's a very difficult area because it's about reputation. And of course the result of, of the book and the work is what we get here, a wide spectrum examination of this area of media law, which uh, being obviously in this case a book which is clear and concise, it's therefore accessible to both lawyers and non-lawyers alike. And although it's aimed primarily at journalists, with journalism students probably at the fore, the book I think reveals the turbulence and the turmoil which characterise the cusp at which law and journalism meet. And I say that because obviously you look at the newspapers, some are timid, some aren't. The Sun newspaper is not a timid newspaper and it's quite happy, uh, currently going through the courts with a number of pieces of litigation, quite happy to, to enter the fight. Others do tend to back down, thinking of the Jeffries case uh, some years ago from Bristol, where they did have to back down because the treatment uh, to Mr Jeffries was absolutely disgraceful and they didn't bother to fight it, but quite often they will. And that's, of course, when you get the interesting discussions and points of law coming up. Now, what we've got here is a picture of Cliff. Um, it's an illust illustrative uh, touch on the cover, which shows him as in a triumphant and much relieved position. Now, Cliff, Richard, you probably know, is a singer. Uh, he was elated at a decision in his favour in a famous case of 2018. 
course, his real name isn't Cliff Richard, it's uh, Harry Webb, but he was down for the purposes of Richard. It's listed in the book of, book's table of cases as Sir Cliff Richard OBE versus the British Broadcasting Corporation. But do, as I said, be careful of the citations. Richard versus the BBC, Richard and the BBC, whatever. Um, the difficulty you've got is, of course, these people are, in the past, they were actually suing whilst they're showbiz name is a particular name they were actually quite often suing in a totally with a totally different name so you don't quite know initially who they might be that's one of the problems with the older case law i think we've become a bit more up to date with the names of the people like elton john for instance people who are, are very well known nationally and internationally of course that case um, of cliff is worth more than just a cursory look and of course the tables in the book list many an equally famous case and a celebrity name much reported of course in the media and I have to say misreported uh, because you're not going to be able to get either on television or in the media the, exactly what happened in court. The only thing that you will get is a transcript which will give you the blow by blow account even that's not good enough because you don't know the demeanour of the people. That's why they should all be filmed, these cases. But that's for the future. Still not taking any notice of that. We have got new technology coming in now, which is making life a bit easier. But at the end of the day, you end up with a law report and then selected bits which are in news items. And the same with bites on, on, on the TV and so on. So the difficulty is that you're not getting the overall picture at all. You're getting one minute's worth of what happened in a week or a day or whatever it might be. So primarily this book from Ursula Smart functions as a textbook and it's it's a great one because it's easy to read. Um, for someone like me I find it fascinating because you look at it and you've it suddenly rem you remember all of the the cases that you've been seeing in the Times Law Reports for instance and it's one of the more engaging textbooks I think that you might find. Certainly it's aimed at journalists and those studying journalism. It's pointed out in the book's introduction that journalism is a highly qualified occupation requiring a high level of education and training including preferably a degree or higher level qualification. Uh, Jeremy Clarkson note although I would say with people like Jeremy that because they haven't got the higher level of qualification, they're still extremely good uh, journalists. Um, Sir Howard Evans, who's just died, another good example, who didn't go to university. And then you've got Peregrine Walsthorne, who's also just died, who did, who went to both Oxford and Cambridge. And of course, he also, these, these are people who treat journalism as a craft, which is what it is. Now, what is also handy about this book is that it covers the law of the entire United Kingdom. That covers both England and Wales, plus Scots and Northern Irish devolved legislation. In addition, EU law and human rights. And I think that's important to bear in mind for the four nations and, of course, our relationship both with the EU post-Brexit and, of course, human rights law itself and where we are at the moment at the end, towards the end of 2020, where we probably will be getting some sort of um, revision of the Human Rights Act at some stage, uh, although whether we do in the short term is another matter. We're looking specifically at Article 8 and Article, Article 8 and 10 of the Human Rights um, Act. Fortunately for time-starved readers, the book features a comprehensive table of contents, which I found very helpful. Also, of course, you've also got a great index and numerous study aids, which of course very much part of the, the modern way of, of teaching, which I think is very helpful. It's the way I was taught when I did my PGCE. Um, you've got boxed notes and sample examination questions throughout. Again, very helpful. Always thinking about the exam technique and the question and answering it, which is the favourite non-answer that you get in court and on the television these days. And of course, in addition to that, you've got a wealth of cases, statutes, and a very useful and detailed glossary, which I did find helpful, to cover the acronyms and the legal terms. The biography at the back is a uh, reasonable length, and I think it will be a boon to researchers in this field, so that anyone professionally involved with the media, from print and broadcast to social media, and his relevant laws, will find the book quite a find. The book was published um, in the late summer of 2020. I haven't got the exact date, I think it's September, but um, just having a look at it again, it's a first-class book. Just to give you an idea of the 
uh, why it's a textbook as much as anything else. Questions and answers. It's in the middle of the book. It's about human rights, privacy and uh, media freedom. That is the big issue. Um, do you have the freedom to publish or is there a right to privacy? The argument goes both ways. I've always made it very clear that I'm in favour of uh, media freedom because I believe that that is the basis of democracy, whereas privacy tends to allow people to buy their way out of a problem. It happens on a regular basis in the courts, which I don't like. They're able to get things to keep matters quiet with uh, all sorts of uh, agreements, and non-disclosure agreements, whatever you want to call them. Big problem. And it's something that won't be resolved anytime soon. But I've stood very clearly on the side of journalists, and that is that uh, there must be media freedom. That's just on the basis of human rights. And then, of course, you go over the page, you get to defamation, which is also fascinating because you've got a 2013 Act now, a much more newer one than the one I knew all those years ago. Then you've got the lovely case, Simmons Stretch, well-known uh, classic. Defamation is a publication, an untrue statement about a person that tends to lower his reputation in the opinion of right-thinking members of the community or the society general or in general, or the man on the Clapham Mumler bus, or the woman, or the person on the Clapham Mumler bus, you can see that things have changed a lot over the years. And then just looking again, court reporting, another area where I think with the COVID-19 problems that we have, and the fact that virtually everything I'm doing now is online, it's by telephone or by a cloud video platform, Zoom, Skype, that, that type of mechanism, we've got a very different way of doing things. And I don't see it changing. In the meantime, though, I'd like to thank Ursula very much for the new edition. Wish her great success with it and the work she does, which is to produce. And I've met some of the students that she's taught, lo lovely people. Uh, I, I know that they find what she produces excellent. I'd like to thank her very much and all the people involved in the new edition. Thank you and good luck with the book. Bye-bye.